call now for the report on the Committee of the Chaplains to His Majesty's Forces, Scott Brown, convener. Moderator, it is my privilege to present the report of the Committee on Chaplains to His Majesty's Forces. Moderator, our armed forces of all three services are being asked to do more and more. I've heard at first hand in the past year of the increased pressures on resources, on personnel and their families. As a nation, we continue to support NATO and our people are deployed globally on so many different operational fronts in the Baltic States, in the Red Sea and the Arabian Gulf, in Cyprus and in the Mediterranean. We all know the context of the last months and years, and we truly pray for the peace of the world, and we fully support our armed forces personnel who do their duty in our name. Your predecessor moderator, Mrs. Foster Fulton, and I had the opportunity at first hand during her visit to the Royal Air Force, of the chaplain's role, the spiritual and pastoral care of military personnel and their families. We are humbled, and we were humbled, by those in command who gave great credit to the work done by their chaplaincy teams of all faiths and beliefs, and the sacrifice that they make in their daily ministries. Even if not able to fully articulate it, the command were fully aware of the added value of the chaplain and what the chaplain brings to a warship or a regiment or a busy air station. The chaplain is fully part of the military, but somehow outside it too. And the sailor, soldier or airman and women see a minister or priest or rabbi Someone who cares, someone who listens, and is the friend and advisor to all. And every chaplain sitting before you today will have their own stories of caring for the spiritual, pastoral, and moral care of their people, or simply at times just being there, representing their own faith community, in our case being somehow the living embodiment of Christ in that place. So wherever our military personnel are, it is the ministry of Christ's church and in our name that our ministers take up that call with the personal sacrifices that come with any ministry for the chaplain and their family. And that's where I want to come to the heart of our report this year. Our ability to recruit Church of Scotland ministers to serve as military chaplains is no longer just an identified risk. It is now a big issue. Moderators saying that our chaplains need to run 50 kilometers before breakfast is not helpful. <laughs> Our numbers are at historic lows. In the regular force, we have two chaplains in the Royal Air Force, three in the Royal Navy, and only 13 in the Army. And with that last number, we expect a number of retirements in the next few years. And we have gaps in our reserve forces too. Since the Blue Book went to print, Positively, we have endorsed one parish minister for reserve service in the army. And hopefully by this time next year, he'll be sitting here in uniform. The issue, and we want to be clear with the church, is that the Church of Scotland could disappear from the chaplaincies of the three services. That would, in our view, be a disaster. We pray to God for increased vocations to this particular ministry and would ask the whole church to pray 
with us and for us. But the problem is this. The statistics I got from one to one of the 540 odd parish ministers in January of this year, only 105 are 49 or under. Only 24 are 39 or under. These figures clearly demonstrate the problem we have in recruiting younger ministers in the main to military chaplaincy. And that should be an alarm bell ringing, I think, for the whole church too. And so, as I have done last year and my predecessors before me, if any eligible minister wants to get in touch to have an informal conversation with myself or my committee to explore what it means to be a military chaplain and it's not running 50 kilometers before breakfast. <laughs> Either full-time as a regular or part-time as a reservist, I cannot commend it more highly to you. Moderator, today is an opportunity again to give our thanks to those who serve in this unique community, that in the highs and lows they may know that they are held in the prayers of the church and that we as a general assembly value highly what they do. But moderator, to close a message of hope, Ukrainian chaplains have been training at the Armed Forces Chaplaincy Centre, a part of the United Kingdom Defence Academy. Everyone has been moved by their strength, their resilience, and truly the love of their own land that they fight for this very day. They gifted the principal of the house, the Reverend Dr. Mark Davidson, a Church of Scotland chaplain, a naval chaplain who is with us today. And they presented this icon to the house. It depicts the destruction of Ukraine. It depicts the sorrow of the angels and the intercession of Mary for those who are suffering. They left to return to Ukraine for immediate deployment to the front line. They left grateful, uplifted, hopeful for a better tomorrow, trusting in God and their faith in Jesus Christ. Let us also pray for them today and for their ministry among their own people. Moderator, I am not a commissioner and we invite the principal clerk to move the deliverance. I so move. Seconded. Thank you. I have notice of some comments um, on the screen, so I would like to call on John Bradley, P. Clancy and Russell Barr. Thank you, moderator. I had the privilege, when I was a student at the Divinity... Oh, sorry, name and number, please. Uh, 197 Bradley. Thank you. When I was a student, I had the privilege of being taught by, uh, I think, well-known in my generation uh, theologian, Murdo Huey MacDonald, who had been a chaplain. Uh, I think he had been also a graduate of Stalag Luft. Can I, can I interrupt you a wee second? I, I know you've been very kind in addressing the chaplains. Oh, sorry, but, sir. But would you mind addressing the microphone? <laughs> 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 so that people online can hear you. Sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> sorry. Uh, he was a graduate of Stalag Luft III and a graduate of Kolditz in his career. The last occasion he had a public profile was in his mid-80s, the police interviewed him because he had a, grabbed a young man stealing a purse from a lady in the queue for their pension and, a, let's say, had administered some Jedburgh justice mm. at the age of 85. I, was the, I had the honour of being taught by this man. And one of the things that he would knock into us was when you are speaking in public, stand up, speak up, then shut up. <laughs> I am going to do this now. 
This is possibly the shortest intervention. In Jeremiah chapter 8, we read a very, very well-known verse. Is there any balm in Gilead? Gilead was a center of the pharmaceutical industry and had been destroyed. The chemist shops were empty. Everything was gone. And this famous verse has come down to us. Is there no balm in Gilead healing? We respect you people here. We respect the work that you do because the people that you deal with are often the sons and daughters or the grandsons and daughters of us here and congregations throughout Scotland. And we value this. We respect you. We support you. And we pray for you. I would like to suggest that what you are is more than just chaplains and officers in the army or the navy, again, but you are envoys of the Prince of Peace. And you are also, especially when you're overseas in areas of conflict and possibly combat, you are the dispensers of the balm of Gilead. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. P. Clancy. Rita, um, like yourself and many others over this week, the name situation gets a wee uh -huh. bit... I'm just about to tell my uh -huh. name. The name gets a bit complicated. I'm actually known as Jill Clancy. The P is all my dad's fault, and I'm number 91. So, Jill Clancy, 91. Moderator, I want to take this opportunity to thank the Assembly for acknowledging yearly this valuable ministry of chaplains to His Majesty's forces. And I'm saddened to read that they have reported that their numbers are in a historic low, which will be the reason I was given a card by one of the chaplains here today from the RAF. So I do pray that some of us may begin to feel called into this important ministry because many of the people they serve may find themselves in very frightening and fragile environments, and some very young men and women may have left their homes for the first time. They all need a chaplain, those with or without faith. They need someone that can support them, listen to them, rather than instruct and order them. I was also encouraged to read that for continuance professional development of the chaplains, there was a tri-service conference held to support them and a time where the chaplains could have fellowship together. I was encouraged that the chaplains and their families receive pastoral contact by the committee where they discuss discernment of their future service. Now, I'm extremely grateful and thankful for all this support the Church of Scotland and its committee give, just as I was encouraged yesterday when I heard the workplace chaplains are supporting Crossreach and their workers. Why do I make this comment, moderator? Well, it's because I am a full-time prison chaplain in His Majesty's Prison of Berlin. As a prison chaplain, I require to be part of the church and be a member of presbytery. But I have to be honest, over the last 11 years, being a prison chaplain, seven being full-time, I felt a little like the men.
my presbytery, then convener of the Business and Nomination Committee as they transitioned into a much larger presbytery. I'm now serving as vice convener. I've been an interim moderator and help with pulpit supply where I'm able. All of my presbytery work I do out with my full-time post, like many of our church members on a voluntary basis. But as Reverend Margaret MacArthur said yesterday, our calling to ministry is a vacation, not a job. I'm just about to finish. The reason I share all of this with the assembly during this report is because I am proud that our chaplains of the armed forces are being presented and supported. But I humbly ask that you may not forget the other Church of Scotland ministers, deacons and elders who serve this church in an extremely privileged yet difficult ministry in an extremely broken and volatile environment under His Majesty's title. And just as a little appendix, the gentleman that gave me his card yesterday told me that as at his Presbyterian Church's yearly gatherings, all chaplains, all chaplains are presented to their moderator and a five minute presentation by all the chaplains, military, hospital, hospice, education, university, prison, etc., etc., are all presented, encouraged, and supported. Thank you, moderator. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Bath. Moderator Russell Barr, number 264. You have so many things to look forward to in your year of office, and one of them, and it will be a delight, will be your engagement with our armed forces. I did not come from a military family, I don't think you do either, and so it was eye-opening for me to be part and to visit and to spend time with each of the different branches of the armed forces during my year of office, and in particular, the army. I saw army chaplains working as teams, something our faith action group could learn from as we seek to roll out team ministry across our country. I saw them working ecumenically in a way that I do not observe within Scotland, something we could all learn from. And I saw them working, living beside and spending time with young men and women that sadly we do not see in any great numbers in our churches. And I learned, and you will learn too. I learned about ministry. I spent time at Purbright, one of the army training centers in England. I met with recruits two weeks into their initial training. How are you getting on? What's the accommodation like? What's the food like? Always ask what the food is like. <laughs> Always ask. How are you getting on with the, the trainers? What are the officers like? Are they looking after you? What are the surprises? What are the challenges? About 30 young men and women sitting in front of me. And then I asked, have you met your chaplain yet? Oh, yes, they said. Oh, we've met the chaplain. Good, I thought. So what does the chaplain do? They turned, started to chat to one another, and about 20 seconds later, one of them turned back to me and said, I don't know what he does, but he's always there. Mm. Knowing the military now, there will be briefing papers that run to 20 pages on what it means to be a chaplain. One sentence suffices. I don't know what he does, but he's always there. Moderator, you have a treat in store. Thank you. I have no notices of anyone else wishing to speak, so do we move to receiving the report? Sorry. Uh, that is fine. You want to come to that microphone, please? Give your name and number. You see, you've been showing up, so my apologies. 
Thank you very much, moderator. Ruth Kennedy, number 307. Apologies if I got the hub wrong. I'm a first time commissioner. <laughs> so I'm kind of hoping that there might be a, a little bit of forgiveness there, but thank you for inviting me to speak. Thank you. Thank you, convener and committee for your report. And thank you to all our guests for joining us today as well, uh, as we are all together in the service of our Lord and what we do. I should say from the outset, I'm the minister for Sanctuary First and also the Digital Ministries Advisor for uh, the Church of Scotland. So I am a member of staff on the Centrally, Central Service. Do you know, I don't know what the acronym stands for. CSE, Darren will tell me. <laughs> so, uh, um, but I'm also with the hat on today as the sports chaplain with Scottish Cycling Mountain Bike Cross Country Race Series. And I really want to commend the work of the chaplains, particularly in the military this morning. Um, it is, yes, we've heard a difficult role whereby you stand in a place of liminality, one foot as church and one foot in military and, and both in different places as well, bringing the kingdom of God as much as is possible. During my training, for I am one of those 104 people, uh, I had the opportunity to do a placement with the Navy. Unfortunately, due to family commitments, I was not able to take up that placement. However, we do have a friend in the gallery today, a member of the public gallery, who is a member of the, was it 24 of the under 39s? And she did do her placement with the military, I think just last summer, and has come back absolutely beaming from her placement as with the chaplaincy, with the military chaplaincy there. And I really want to encourage us as the General Assembly, moderator yourself as well, and for those people that we might meet, for those who are thinking about ministry and beginning to discern a call as well, that a call to ministry in the chaplaincy force, uh, with the forces and with the prison services and in our other areas as well, is as much a call to ministry as it is to any other place, whether that be a geographic location or with another sub-community, that we are all needed. And I was so delighted that the training team are flexible and open-minded to think that yes, we can offer placements uh, as part of the training uh, for ministry with the military as well. So you asked for ideas, um, and I'm just commending that idea that there are placements and flexibility within the training program for candidates in training to come and serve as chaplains with the military. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you. Thank you. Moderator. I'm hearing a voice. Oh, oh, hello. I'm I hearing a voice. <laughs> Sally's in my head again. <laughs> Sorry, I, I did plug in apologies. One more, one more comment and then we'll move to receiving Perfect. the report. And, and I will be brief. Um, Foster Fulton 536, to echo what Russell Barr said, basically. I, had, I, I visited the RAF this year. I don't think it would surprise any of you to know that it's not my natural habitat. But my were my preconceived notions blown away. And FAPOLT and our exploration into team ministry, please tap in to the wisdom, to the expertise, to the love of those chaplains and those teams. I've never met such an incredibly cohesive team who knew exactly what they were about. And what they were about was looking after, listening, and loving people. It, it resonated throughout the whole three days. And they absolutely, you don't know what they're doing, but they're always, always there. So thank you for what you do. Please know that our prayers and our gratitude are, are with you. And thank you for your wisdom. And let's please tap into it. Thank you. Thank you. I right, move to receive the report. Does the Assembly receive the report? And online, thank you. Uh, section 2. We have notice of a comment. Uh, Erzoa Glenick, we have you. Thank you, moderator. I was not planning to speak this morning but when I was just reminded 
of the presence and the work of NATO and His Majesty's forces done in the Baltic states, my heart leapt. And it also broke a little bit, hearing about the lack of people wanting to support this work. I want to address the young and not so young people discerning their ministries and urge them to ask if in their heart might be a call to support this vital work, especially now in a situation very close in Ukraine. My people have been living beside Russia for thousands and thousands of years. We have been occupied by Russia again and again. I know what it means to grow up behind closed borders. I know what it means if your family is separated for life, if your closest family's friends are sent to war camps in Siberia and they die and you never see them again. That is the kind of violence that is there. So thank you so much for the presence, for the service, for the work you do. And young people looking for ministry, this is your chance to change the world even just a little bit. Thank you. And my name is Glienecke and it's number six, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Bill Wishart. Moderator Wishart, number 24. Um, I come from a, a military family. Both my brothers served in the forces. Um, I just want to ask a quick question. It says several times um, in the deliverances, eligible ministers. Now, this is not an application, <laughs> right? Seriously, you, you don't want me. But what is the age, um, the age limit for um, ministers to apply for, for the forces? I think I'm too old anyway. Moderator, and I'm looking to the three heads of chaplaincy, 54 for regular ministry and can serve up to the age of 60. That's a relief. <laughs> <laughs> but Bill, I'm sure we could sponsor you to join in the 50 mile hike before breakfast. <laughs> Hi, right. <laughs> Section two. <laughs> And agreed online, thank you. Um, section three. Yep, I've got Jeff Berry down twice. I hope it's just hit the button twice. And Suzanne Fletcher. So Jeff Berry, first of all, please. Apologies, moderator. Uh, Jeff Berry, number 53, a total uh, internet uh, or information technology Luddite. Uh, to the young lady from the uh, Barlini, I could offer you an army uh, chaplain's <laughs> card. Uh, uh, play, we, we, we have some great toys to play with as well. Mm -hmm. Moderator, I stand before you in the interest of transparency. I have to declare an interest in this. I would like to thank the, the convener and the committee, not just for the support this year, but previous conveners and previous committees over the years. The Church of Scotland has been exceptionally supportive of military chaplaincy. Yes, we talk about um, ecumenical work. Uh, we have got an incredible ecumenical team even here. You probably wouldn't realize just how many uh, major denominations are represented here. But obviously we talk, chaplains talk. We talk to each other as well as the troops. And we understand from our colleagues from other churches just how rich the support we have received from the Church of Scotland has been. So. You certainly have my heartfelt thanks, and I suspect my colleagues would absolutely agree with that. There you go. See? They can do it as well. 
I have to confess, I had no interest, or no, I had no, no, um, no plan to join the military. Uh, an old minister told me as I was going through probation, if you want to give God a good laugh, tell him I have a plan. <laughs> because usually that plan does not always equate with his plan. Like yourself, moderator, uh, I didn't really know what I wanted to do, but I was sure I wanted to be in a parish ministry. During the height of the Afghan campaign, I was approached by the local chaplain to work with two Scots as an officiating chaplain to the military. This is a civilian post. It's a, an exceptionally uh, encouraging and enthusing post. Working two afternoons a week, as it was at that time, with, the, uh, with two Scots and Penny Cook, revitalized and energized my parish ministry. I'm standing here today not so much as somebody in the military who is coming to the end of a career, but rather to encourage the assembly, to encourage the Kirk, and to encourage those who are eligible to realize that parish ministry and chaplaincy in any form are not mutually exclusive. Moderator, very briefly, because so much has already been said, I would like to emphasize, as has been pointed out, the, the ecumenical nature. The teamwork that we have is phenomenal, and I, I wouldn't know how to, to operate without almost being part of a team now where I can phone someone for support or I can get somebody in to help. We have a huge variety in our ministry. Some days we're in amazing places, some, place, some days we're in the mud. But the one thing I will say is it's about intensity. The military is almost like um, civilian life writ large. We have a code of conduct, we have, we have values and standards that we have to live by because we go into some horrible places. But something that, moderator, you were told by the outgoing moderator on Saturday was be yourself. You don't have to be able to run 50 miles before breakfast. <laughs> Can I just say there is a solution to that? It's called a biff chit. <laughs> Chaplains are very good at getting sick chits. We call them biff chits. We could almost get them laminated. We're good at that. <laughs> Not all of us have to be fit enough to smash out a three mile run in under 15 minutes. Most of us would more likely smash out a three course lunch. <laughs> <laughs> but something that struck a chord with what you said earlier on is it's about being yourself and, val and having people around you. On Saturday, uh, His Grace commented on the support they had received from chaplains. That is simply what we try to do in the good times and the bad times. I, I won't uh, make the obvious statement that uh, his chaplain sitting there is ex-Black Watch, so <laughs> go army. Mm. <laughs> what I would like to say is that if God has placed a call in your life, he has already factored in your strengths, your weaknesses, your failings and your frailties, or in my case, a warped sense of humor. Ask me over coffee sometime about the trip flare and the shovel recce. I have mentioned, see the military people know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> I've spoken about variety. I have had the surprising occasion to stand among those whom are deemed as exalted within society. But more importantly, far more importantly, I've also had the privilege of kneeling with the broken. I am coming to the end of my army chaplaincy. It wasn't my plan to join ministry or to join chaplaincy, but I'm coming to the end. I'll spend the next six months supporting our troops as we train Ukrainian soldiers before they'd return to the front lines. It will be a harrowing ministry. It'll be a, a harrowing time for our young troops. I ask your prayers. And for those of you who are able, if you can pick up the torch to shine the light of the hope of the gospel, into the lives of our wonderful young people who serve in the military. Please do so. Suzanne Fletcher, then Sean Swindell. Moderator 65, Suzanne Fletcher. I came to the charge that I am in um, 13 years ago. And when I arrived, I realized there was not a lot being done in youth work. And I tried to kind of see what the young people were up to. And quite a few of them were involved in the sea cadets. 
And so I went along to our local sea cadet unit and spoke to the staff there, thinking this is a way that I can be with my young people in, from my parish. And um, the convener has met some of them at a um, special ceremony last year. I just want to commend sea cadet chaplaincy, all cadet chaplaincy to the assembly. If you don't feel that you can do the necessary for the part-time or full-time chaplaincy and the services. It's a wonderful way to get to know the young people in your community. There are lots of toys to play with, even in the cadets. And you get to have a very special place in their lives and in the lives of the staff, all of whom are volunteers. And I started out one night a month here and there. And now that my children have come of age to join cadets, feel that I can give more because I'm doing it as a parent as well as a chaplain and have had amazing experience doing this um, in our local area around Dunbar, but also in the Edinburgh district and the northern area and beyond. And I just want to commend the chaplaincy for the cadets to all of the commissioners don't have to be a minister, you can get involved, and sometimes it does lead on to other calls and other things. And I look forward to seeing the convener again on Sunday at a service I believe he's leading um, at the Admiral Ramsey Museum. So thank you very much for this moment to speak. Thank you. And Sean. Um, one of the ones at the, the side. There you go, it's lit up waiting for you. <laughs> Moderator 374, Sean Swindells. Um, just really want to echo what was said by the previous speaker. Um, I used to be a chaplain in the reserve some years ago, and I found that it enriched my civilian ministry in ways that I could not imagine. Um, but for those of you who are unable to run 50 kilometers before <laughs> breakfast, which is a marathon plus an additional eight kilometers, um, please seriously consider Cadet Force Chaplaincy. I know that we're all very busy. Sometimes we're busier than we should be. A lot of the time we're busier than we should be. But it will enrich your ministry. It'll be a great being uh, with the energy and the enthusiasm and the laughter of young people. But it really is a privilege. And you will get out of it more than you put into it personally. Um, it, you will find it will enrich your ministry, and I would strongly commend it. Thank you, moderator. Right, thank you. I then put section three to the assembly. And online, thank you. Uh, and a new section four uh, in the name of Michael Goss. Thank you, moderator. Well, Clark will read it first of all, Michael. Thank you, Mike. Uh, new section four in the name of Michael Goss. Acknowledge the committee's tireless work towards recruitment and instruct the committee to produce a letter defining the role, rights and deployment protections for reservist chaplains and Kirk sessions. Thank you very much, Clark. Thank you, moderator. Uh, Mike Goss, number 312. And I want to add my own thanks to all those who faithfully serve our armed forces in every service and in every capacity. They're chaplains and the committee that serves them. It's a huge amount of service for which the church is grateful. And it's a service and sacrifice that helps secure our freedoms today. I'm a minister in a local parish church in earshot of the firing ranges at Barry Budden. And I've been delighted on occasion to welcome visiting cadets and their chaplains to services of worship in one of our local buildings. But it's not been my calling to serve which has been a regret of mine. I'd love to have been uh, in the chaplains and with some of the forces. And I've often wondered, is this a call that the Lord has on me? It hasn't been. And now I'm too old. <laughs> However, the need for chaplaincy is vital. It's an essential part of the church's witness and service to our nation and beyond, especially to so many uh, of the young men and women who make up the forces. And in seeking recruitment to this ministry, communication to churches is paramount. 
And in particular, I understand that the committee, and I believe the assembly, really wants to recruit new reserve chaplains from our local congregations. It's not taking them away. You don't lose a minister. But what is it that it means to be a reserve chaplain? What's involved? And a lot of uh, uh, ministers will not know what kind of role this might be. So uh, in, in that, I'm moving this deliverance, finding out that you don't actually need to do the 50 miles, etc. But there are other things that are demanded and other things that you are able to get out of it, a huge amount. And uh, the, the role, the rights, the deployment protections, all that is there around reserve as chaplains and for Kirk Sessions to understand as well. And so I move the deliverance. Is that seconded? Aye. Seconded. I've got a question in, and questions are always in order. So I'm going to ask Christine Murdoch for her question, please. Murdoch 148. It's a question for Mr. Goss, Goss, and I wonder if you would add in the words and cadets. I would be content to have that, but uh, the convener I know has been willing to accept this. Is the convener uh, willing to accept that as well? Yes. Okay, so in my mind, we need to ask, you're proposing an uh, amendment to the new section. I didn't uh, know how to ask to do that, sorry, moderator. <laughs> as someone said earlier, uh, they're a first-time commissioner. I'm a first-time moderator, so <laughs> forgive me if I, if I get this wrong. <laughs> you expecting another go? <laughs> The way things have been going, I've been offered it. Um, <laughs> would, would the, uh, have you got a seconder for adding that? Seconded. Thank you Thank very you. much. Um, Clark, do you want to just... <laughs> uh, and cadets, I think, was the only addition um, to what was said. So, Protections for reservist and cadet chaplains. After reservist, yeah. yeah. But we'll, we'll let these folks sort out exactly. I think we, we, we know what you mean. Is the Assembly happy to accept the amendment to the new section? <laughs> Online, are we accepting that? Okay, okay, online have accepted that. Uh, I have no other notices to speak. I uh, put then the, this new section, the amended new section, to the Assembly. Thank you, moderator. And online, thank you. Move then to section four, as is in the print. Right, somebody wanted to speak in section four. Ah, they've just come up. Jack Shuttleworth. Where are they? Moderator, Jack Shuttleworth, 295. I'd like to thank the committee for the report and the assembly for this opportunity to speak. In 2019, about five years and four stone ago, I was serving as an air engineering technician on board HMS Duncan during operations in the Mediterranean and Black Sea. Shortly after departing Odessa, Ukraine, our commanding officer mustered us in the hangar. We were ordered to sail south of the Suez Canal and carry out ships protection operations in the Persian Gulf during a period of diplomatic and geopolitical uncertainty. This extended our deployment by three months. While this news was heartbreaking for all of us, for those with young families, it was particularly difficult. Our chaplain took the time to identify which members of the ship's company had small children, and he wrote them a personal letter to each child, explaining in a way they could understand whether mammy or daddy wouldn't be back as promised, and assuring them that they would be okay. Not each family, but each child. Friends, this is ministry performed by extraordinary people in extraordinary circumstances. In 2019, while serving on HMS Diamond, 
Our chaplain would conduct a compline service at the end of each working day, around nine o'clock or 2100 or so. Initially, only a few attended. However, over the following weeks, more and more joined. Questions were asked and answered, relationships were built, and the gospel was shared. Friends, this is mission carried out by extraordinary people of God in extraordinary circumstances. I am sure that over the years, this assembly has heard countless stories of what these people of God do day in and day out. However, today, on behalf of the veterans community and my friends still serving, I would like to thank the Armed Forces chaplains for all they do. Friends, chaplains are not just Haribo merchants who spread joy throughout a military unit. They are valued members of the structure and framework of His Majesty's Armed Forces, offering guidance and counsel in extremely difficult and sensitive situations. But as mentioned before, they are always there in moments of joy and celebration and in moments of loss and pain. Emotions that are always just a decision away in military life. So on behalf of all the Torags and rascals and stellar individuals that you serve and have served, thank you, moderator. Right, section four in the print. And online. Thank you. Section five. Section six. And the deliverance as a whole. Convener. Moderator, one of the members of His Grace's party is Air Vice Marshal Tim Jones, Assistant Chief of the Air Staff in the Royal Air Force. Moderator, should you choose to invite him, and if it be the will of the General Assembly, I am sure the Air Vice Marshal would be willing to address us. Is it the will of the General Assembly that we hear from Air Vice Marshal Tim Jones? Welcome, Air Vice Marshal. You have been invited to come onto the floor of the Assembly, which is a, a special privilege, and we look forward to hearing your message to us this morning. Moderator, Commissioners, friends, it's a great honour to join you this morning uh, for a part of your proceedings and to be asked to address you. On behalf of the Air, Air Chief of the Air Staff, Air Chief Marshal Sir Richard Knighton, I offer the warm greetings from the Royal Air Force. And if I may, I also, also offer those greetings on behalf of our colleagues in the Royal Navy and the Army. We have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll, fastened to the rock which cannot move, grounded firm and deep in the Saviour's love. Words from the famous hymn written by Priscilla Owens in 1882, and words sung by me every Friday when I was growing up only a few miles from here as a member of the Boys' Brigade at St. John's Church in Bukiring, a church where the famous Ebenezer Brown had preached for 55 years in the late 18th and 19th century where Robert Moffat had sat, quite possibly contemplating one of his 
great expeditions to Africa in the 1800s. But for me, it was where I grew up. Friday nights at the BBs, under the watchful and guiding leadership of Jackie Pope and John Belford, servants to the community and role models to us boys. Sunday morning, playing the church organ. Oh my goodness, that church organ. It was awful. <laughs> it was beautiful, but terribly wheezy and barely audible. I suspect we've all been there. And then one day, the minister, the Reverend Bill Baird, he was such a lovely man, he said, we really must do something about this. And so the minutes of the meeting of the Kirk session read as follows. Volume from church organ, unacceptable. Order placed for one new electric motor to power the bellows. And so it was, a new electric motor was fitted to power the bellows, but... Nobody had thought to check what the right specification was <laughs> for the new motor. Well, friends, I will never forget. The first hymn that morning was, All People That On Earth Do Dwell. And let me put it this way. When I played the opening chord, I think all people on earth that morning must have had their fingers in their ears. <laughs> because even though we were in Fife, that organ, I think, could be heard in Aberdeen. <laughs> the minutes of the next meeting of the Kirk session read as follows. <laughs> Volume from church organ, unacceptable. <laughs> Order placed for 50 sets of ear defenders. <laughs> well, I made up the bits about the Kirk session minutes, clearly, but the rest of it is absolutely true. And of course, what it meant was that each week our our hymn choice became more strident. Bill, I would say, do we really need to sing Onward, Christian Soldiers for the fifth week running? Oh, go on then. Formative years and happy days. And days without which I would not have gone on to do what I've done with my career. Days that taught me about the inevitable storms of life when the clouds unfold their wings of strife when the strong tides lift and the cables strain, will your anchor drift or firm remain? Our job in the armed forces is to help face the storms of life, to do our part to stop conflicts starting, and if they start, to help bring them to an end as quickly as possible. And right now, of course, we live in a very stormy world where there is a lot of conflict going on. And so perhaps more than ever, we feel the weight of our responsibility. Our responsibility towards the security, stability, and prosperity of the places we live, of our families, and of our friends. In the RAF, we currently have almost every frontline aircraft deployed and on operations. Across Eastern Europe, the Middle East, and Cyprus, the Falkland Islands, and here, our quick reaction alert aircraft are on standby 24 hours a day to protect UK airspace. We've also been patrolling over the Black Sea along the eastern border of the NATO alliance in the face of Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine. And at the same time, we've continued to conduct operations against ISIS in Syria and Iraq. And as tensions heightened in Sudan last year, we evacuated more than 2,000 people from that country bringing them to safety. And more recently, we conducted airdrops of aid into Gaza directly to the people who need it. But friends, these are responsibilities that none of us can discharge on our own, which is why the incredible team, the incredible community, which is our armed services, owes all that it is to the people whose sense of responsibility and service drives them towards being part of that great calling that is to serve our country. And amongst those today, I single out our service chaplains. In the excellent report, for the Kirk on their work over the past year, we were reminded of what a vital role you play in that most important aspect of teamwork, the belief and trust that propels us forward, what we know as the moral component. 
I remember a few years ago, I was in charge of RAF operations in the Middle East, and during a particularly tense period, um, I went over to our operations center. There, our UK team would oversee our missions 24 hours a day, experiencing the pressure of making life or death decisions, while our pilots would place themselves in harm's way every day over the skies of some of the most dangerous places on Earth. I remember one day being over in the operations center on the screens, uh, feeds from across the region showing our own aircraft and those of the coalition going about their activity. Sitting earnestly over their consoles were our operations staff, professional, diligent, busy, many of them very young. And then in the corner was our resident chaplain. Not getting in the way, just there. And as the operational events started to escalate, he said to one of the team, shall I leave? No, came the reply from one of the team. Please stay. It's good to have you here. It's good to have you here. Let me assure you, friends, it would simply not be possible to navigate service life without the ability to talk, to confide, to reflect, to laugh, to cry, or to remember. And that's what our service chaplains help us to do. And so in sharing in the experiences of those they serve alongside, our service chaplains occupy a unique place in the fabric of these, our important national institutions on whom our reliance amidst the storms of life seem greater now than at uh, any time for many decades. And so to our chaplains, and on behalf of the, all of the services, I say thank you. Thank you for the generous, steadfast, and dedicated way you support the service family, and for the part you play in ensuring that our armed services can help us navigate the storms of life by meeting the challenge that is placed down in front of us for the sake of our country, our friends, and our families. And to those who would serve, to the extent that you might join us in helping to meet these challenges, I hope you consider yourself to be most welcome. To quote Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, let us hope this to be true and trust that it is. I wish you all the best for the rest of your proceedings, for which I trust no ear defenders will be required. <laughs> thank you again for your support, and thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this morning. Air Vice Marshal Kim, thank you for coming and sharing with us. Uh, Russell said, I, um, like him, uh, I have little background in the military. However, my grandparents, my grandfathers, both served in the First World War and um, come back quite affected by what they endured there. My father, just at the tail end of the Second World War, entered into service with the RAF, and I showed you last night the buttons from his cap badge are my cufflinks that I'm wearing today. So, I know a little, um, but not everything. But as moderator, we want to thank you. We want to thank the services because it's a privilege to have a chat with them, and I'll address them in a moment or two. But we live in a difficult time, and I imagine a lot of the work that you do, a lot of the preparation and training is for scenarios that we hope will never become a reality and that we will never actually find out about the work and the preparation because you do so much of your work unseen. We take what you do for granted and this morning we have an opportunity to publicly thank you, to thank you for the protection the armed forces give us, for the work you do also in humanitarian aid. The sight of your berries must give such hope to communities that have been devastated by some kind of disaster 
natural or otherwise, often in places thousands of miles away from home. Please accept our thanks and the promise of prayer, and please convey to the different branches of our military that thanks that we appreciate. And let me share a prayer with you and with the assembly. It comes from the Book of Common Order that's in the Field Service Book of the British Army. Let us pray. Almighty God, in you alone we find safety and peace. We commend to your gracious keeping all the men and women who serve in the Navy, the Army, or the Air Force, who face danger and put their lives at risk so that others might live in safety. Defend them day by day by your heavenly power and help them to know that they can never pass beyond the reach of your care. Keep alive in them and in us your vision of that peace, which alone we must seek and serve. Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I'm not really getting a chance to say good morning to the chaplains when you've been here for a little time. I had a look at your respective websites. And let me share what I read. The ministry of a naval chaplain is so varied, but also in many ways, just like parish ministry. You become an important part of the community. Surely God is present among those in the most difficult and challenging situations in the world. To be an extension of that as a Royal Naval Chaplain is an absolute privilege. Life as an Army Chaplain is a calling like no other, belonging to a remarkable organization of young men and women, sharing your life with them and serving alongside them wherever they go, brings tremendous opportunities and challenges. It is a vocation that is both demanding and rewarding and offers an adventurous journey of faith. As an RAF chaplain, you are uniquely able to make contact with people at the heart of their working lives. In addition to the normal occupations for ordained people, the conduct of worship, baptisms, marriages, and funerals, you also play an integral part in the community support system that exists within the RAF. You'll also be with people both in joy and sorrow, wherever they are in the world. You'll help people think through the issues that confront them on operations at home and during their normal working lives. It was quite humbling to hear the convener speak of some of the issues that you have to deal with, and it was also humbling to hear people speaking from the floor of the assembly. I would urge the General Assembly to think beyond the words, though, and think about the ministry that you have offered and continue to offer and how that ministry has impacted on the lives of others, often when they're at some of the lowest points in their lives. And I also want to mention the sacrifice you make. Many of you are away for extended periods of time, and that means being away from family and friends and many of the celebrations that the rest of us can never fully appreciate. And while we acknowledge your service, together with your dedication and commitment to bring Christ into the lives of our armed forces personnel, please pass on our thanks to your families. They're often forgotten. To your nearest and your dearest, pass on our grateful appreciation for the sacrifice they make, allowing the church to borrow you and to use you in this unique ministry. I would also like to thank the senior members of the armed forces who are in attendance this morning. Not only to thank you for coming along, but by giving a very visible support to the chaplains who serve with you. Thank you for caring for them. And when you go back to your bases, please pass on to every soldier, sailor, Air Force individual, the deep appreciation of the Church of Scotland for the work that they do, often in difficult scenarios. We are deeply grateful, grateful and assure them of our continuing thoughts and prayers. To all who serve, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. 
May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace now and forevermore. Thank you.